<laughs> Today's session, as I said, is um, understanding open adoption. And first, before I get into that specifically, I would like to address a little bit the various types of adoption. Um, there is agency adoption, and the Independent Adoption Center is a full-service adoption agency. And when you adopt through an agency, uh, it is a private adoption. In fact, we're a nonprofit, and that includes the home study, which is a required part of adoption, no matter what type of adoption professional you use. Um, there's also attorney adoptions, which is also private adoption, but you work with a attorney whose practice specializes in adoption and adoptive placements. And if you use an adoption attorney, then you still need to hire a agency to complete that required home study. And you may have also heard about um, county adoptions or what we call FOST adopt. So the children available through county adoptions are children who were removed from the home of birth family members and become available uh, for adoption. So that's also what we refer to as a public adoption. In terms of um, the areas of adoption, and this applies to all of the three types of adoptions that I mentioned in the previous slide. There is open adoption, which we will be focusing on today. And in an open adoption, that's where the adoptive parents and the birth mo mother or birth parents uh, meet ahead of time and maintain ongoing contact over the life of the child. And there's also closed adoption, which is what we kind of consider the old-fashioned way of adopting. Uh, it's not very common anymore. Um, and that's where everybody pretty much remains anonymous. There's no ongoing contact. And there's no sharing of personal identifying um, information. And a lot of adoption professionals these days will also do what we refer to as semi-open adoption. So that's where the birth parents and the adoptive parents do usually meet each other, but they don't necessarily maintain a lot of ongoing contact or what ongoing contact they have is managed and facilitated through the adoption professional that did the adoptive placement um, initially. Um, I also want to give you just a little bit of guidance in terms of how to pick an adoption professional. Uh, first is to do your research, and obviously you guys are all here today, so you've started doing that, but there's a lot of information available online and other reading um, that you can do. And you can also educate yourselves. Again, um, today is a great start, but to attend various types of informational seminars. And most of your adoption professionals will have or offer their own information or orientation type sessions uh, that you can attend and learn about their programs. And as you're going around and educating yourself, of course, you want to ask questions, a very important aspect of educating yourselves. Um, ask about their statistics, the number of placements every year, what their sort of geography is, um, uh, the age of the children that they place, ethnicities, and if there's any sort of program emphasis, such as openness, which Independent Adoption Center does uh, promote openness, and we do primarily newborn adoptions. So those are the types of questions you want to ask as you're learning. Um, you also want to know if the adoption professional has any restrictions with regards to your ages. Um, some do limit age. They, um, you know, not everybody is open to same-sex adoptive parents or singles. Some are religious affiliated. Um, so those are very important questions to ask as you educate yourself. So I always say um, the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. So here's my thousand words and pictures. That's my personal story with adoption. Um, on the left-hand side is my family. Both of my kids were adopted and have the same birth mother in an open adoption. So their birth mom is now someone who's been part of our lives 
uh, for almost 23 years. Um, and the photo on the right-hand side that was taken in a bowl bowling alley was actually a visit with my kid's birth family. Um, their birth mom went on to get married and have three more kids with her husband. So they're all siblings and refer to each other as brothers and sisters. Um, and we did a visit a few years back. And then the lower photo is actually my son's birth father, who was not part of our lives for 21 years. And after he turned 21, his birth father sought us out, got our contact information, and we did a visit with him. And that's where that picture's from. And in addition, not depicted here, my daughter also placed a baby for adoption in an open adoption three years ago. So I'm actually a birth grandmother. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> A little bit of experience. <laughs> <laughs> so, in words instead of pictures, what is open adoption? Um, open adoption is meeting the birth parents, as I mentioned, ahead of time. It's, it's a process that we refer to as matching with a birth mom. And it's not that your adoption professional matches you with that birth mom, but um, the birth mom actually picks you and you pick her. Um, so it's, it's, we often use a blind dating analogy um, in the field. You meet each other, often online, <laughs> and, um, and it, it, it blossoms from there. Uh, you go to the hospital when the baby is born, when, when, when the birth mother goes into labor, usually she's calling you and you head on to the hospital and as the adoptive parents, you're taking the baby home from the hospital. So these are truly newborn adoptions. And in many cases, um, you would actually be in the delivery room with the birth mother if that's something that she's comfortable with. Um, the other aspect of openness is the ongoing contact. And this is through phone calls, emails, text messages, social media, um, and in-person visits. Um, it's highly encouraged. and um, most adoptions these days have some level of openness in them. And we say that open adoption is all about um, building relationships and expanding your family, not just in terms of the child, but also in terms of the birth family. And we say open adoption creates families. And that's what we're all about. Um, so now I am going to introduce you to our panel. Uh, first, we have uh, Bill Norris and Scout Masterson. Uh, they are TV's uh, The Gunkles uh, from the Tori and Dean show, and they're adoptive parents. And we have Alexandra, or Allie, as we like to call her, Desmond, who placed a baby for adoption um, just a little over a year and a half ago. And we also have Becky Orman, who is our adult adoptee, who was actually placed as an infant through the Independent Adoption Center right about 22 years ago. Um, so first, starting out with Bill and Scout, um, tell us a little bit about what your process was in terms of your decision to adopt. Right, so, oh, how loud is this? So um, for Bill and I, really, I mean, obviously, we could not have a child naturally. And so we thought, you know, we really investigated and really looked around and spoke with a lot of people. Um, for us, we found that uh, surrogacy wasn't right because we didn't feel that need of the genetics or because it was so expensive, to be honest, we could not afford it. And when every, every person that we would ask um, about adoption would say the independent adoption center. They would say, you have to go to IAC. And because we went there, we found it to be so welcoming. Um, our first experience walking in was a kind of, uh, you know, a short kind of half day seminar. Um, <clears throat> and when we walked in, we met all different kinds of people from you know, all walks of life. I mean, single uh, folks, uh, family, you know, uh, people who wanted to be um, parents like us, a same sex, uh, older 
couples. Um, it was really amazing. So we thought this is the place we're not going to um, continue to look. And um, that was kind of our encouragement going to that first seminar. We were like, we left there and we were gung ho. I mean, that was it. We were going to adopt. And so that's when we started our journey. Thank you. Um, and um, you, you kind of covered, you know, why you chose open adoption. But if you can touch yeah. on that a little it, bit more. I just want to say that one thing, it was we, because we adopted and the, we were on Tori and Dean's show and it chronicled our adoption, we get, I don't even know how many Facebook questions of, can um, the birth mother take the baby away from you like they, later on in life? And that's a big question because of the word open, and it, that is not the case. So um, that's one of the like big myths that every single day we get that question, and it's not. It's the word open does not mean open, come back later, and you don't have a child. It's not like that. Um, so I'll let Bill tell. I was just going to say that the reason, uh, one of the reasons open was so appealing to us was that the IAC and, and I'm sure other agencies um, care as much about the birth mother as they care about the adoptive parents. And that was something that was really important to us. Um, and we wanted you know, there to be no secrets in our house. I mean, maybe we're influenced by our own personal stories as, as gay men and being open and honest with, about who we are, that we wanted our child and, and for this process to be the, the same way. Thank you. Um, and tell us a little bit more about the overall experience once you were signed up with us in terms of finding a birth mom um, and the birth of your daughter. Um, we did, went to our initial seminar, which, um, which was great, and then probably took us about three or four months to get our act together. And, <laughs> and we went in and started the process, and it, it's, we're on our sec, we're doing the second adoption right now where we've started the process um, and it's much easier the second time the first time it, it's all new and um, we were so gung-ho we were gonna get on the books so we could start mar essentially marketing ourselves to birth moms we were gonna do it in record time but that was unrealistic <laughs> so um, you know it was just it was a it was a crazy four or five uh, it took six months to get on the books um, you know there's everything from uh, home studies to fingerprints they need to make sure you're not a terrorist um, and you know you have to become a foster parent in the, in the state of California so we had to put a pool fence up and um, just there's so many steps that we needed to do before we could get on the books so and once we were on it was about a year a little over a year and tell us a little bit about Simone. <laughs> I'll say this for <laughs> No, what I'm... Oh, my arm. <laughs> they, um, it, we found it to be a very bonding experience um, following the journey. You know, when you go and you get this binder of things to do and it's broken down and we're like, holy crap. Like, it just, it's sort of like being back in school again. So you, as a family, you know, as a couple, we sat down and we kind of broke down our game plan and it was a lot of fun. We found it to be a very uh, great bonding experience. Our friends and family got involved. Um, we had so many friends, um, you know, once we were on the books, passing along our profiles to everybody and um, Facebooking and sharing and asking people, do you know anybody placing their baby? I mean, it was really cool. And um, it, you find that everyone, kind of is rooting for you. And so with that said, you know, um, Bill and I do have a daughter, Simone, who was here a little earlier. She's turning four, which I cannot believe. It's incredible. Um, and she's uh, amazing. I mean, I can't imagine not having her. Um, so we, you know, and we're just valley dads now. We, <laughs> we don't do, you know, it's okay, interesting. <laughs> I mean, we don't, we used to be at like all the cool restaurants and everything. We don't do that anymore. Um, we find our day like just, you know, we're just like every other family. And we had karate. And our, we had karate this morning. And for in our home, you know, we keep our birth mother's photo. We have a relationship with our birth mother. She doesn't live on the West Coast. She lives on the East Coast. We don't see her. She does have other children now. And she, um, is enjoying raising them, and we swap photos back and forth. And I 
I mean, we speak with her all the time. It's been almost four years. I just text with her last night. So it's all the time. Um, and we don't, you know, it's sort of like a distant relative in a way. Birth fathers. And the birth father for us was not, um, he did not acknowledge Simone when she was born. Um, he signed a paper, you know, of relinquishment. Um, but he kind of. He didn't. He got the paper. We got the paper and ignored it. And then after a certain time. But at the end of the day, at, on her second birthday, we got an email and we saw the name in our inbox. And we were like, oh my gosh, it's the birth father. And, but we've never seen his photo. Um, and for us, our birth mother, we only met her in person for the first time five days before Simone was born. Because we had such a connection that we just kind of let it go and kind of felt like this was the person that was going to be a part of our life. And so we got off the plane for the first time, and that's when we met her. We also so. had five weeks yeah. between the time that we, yeah. I should say we only had five weeks between the time that she picked us to her due date. Yeah, which is considered a very short match yeah. for that period of time. Although we do have last minute placements as well. And just real briefly, um, tell, share with the audience about Hold My Hand. Just because we found so many people um, who followed our journey on the show and kind of on our Facebook, and um, a lot of people just had many questions, and we kept um, offering our advice. We're not professionals, but we're just two dads who adopted, and and so we found ourselves helping people more and more, and so we officially, two going to be three years ago, called it something. Hold my hand, and it's just like kind of like a support thing. So um, a hunt. Uh, the, in 2011, that year, we helped over 250 families. Um, and then last year, almost 200. Um, I didn't count, to be honest. But I know if I counted the emails. Don't have that many fingers. Right. But they, um, you know, it's just like all different things, you know, just kind of stuck in the process. Or how did I get, you know, how did we get started? We just share um, our support, kind of like another friend who understands what's going on in your life. Thank you. And Allie. Allie uh, is a birth mom, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so if you can share with the audience what sort of ran through your mind when you first discovered you were pregnant. Um, when I first found out I was pregnant, I was 19. Um, completely scared out of my mind. Uh, in denial for a really long time. Uh, didn't know what to do, just kind of figured that it would go away. Um, it took a while for reality to really set in that this was the life that I was going to have. And um, I knew about adoption uh, just in the sense that I had heard about it before. I had no idea that open adoption even existed. Um, I never considered it an option. Uh, so when I found out, I literally thought, I am going to be a single mom. And it was scary. Yeah. And how did you find the IAC? Um, I went online. I typed into Google Adoption Agency. Um, I was actually, I think I was 36 weeks. And finally was like, OK, if there's other options out there, I want to know what they are. Uh, I didn't really think it was going to be for me, but I figured I would at least look into it. And so I went online, I looked at the website, I started looking at families. Um, it really seemed too good to be true. And I thought, what would hurt getting more information about it? So I met with a counselor from IAC, and she walked me through what it would be like. And um, I decided that it was for me. And what did, um, what did you like about the whole concept of open adoption? I think I really liked the honesty, that there was no secrets. There was something that everyone was really proud of. Um, I, th I also liked the idea of being able to watch her grow and thrive and not kind of just shipping her off and hoping she was OK and hoping they were taking care of her. and. Um, I really wanted that ongoing contact. Okay, and was it hard to find a family? 
Uh, I thought it was going to be. Um, when I decided for sure, I was 38 weeks. And I thought, okay, I now have two weeks to find people that are going to raise my child. Um, really scary. And I was really scared I was going to settle. And I came across a family. Um, I had seen them online when I was looking. And then when I got my profiles to look through from the agency, they were in there again. And something just really stood out about them. And I just felt like they were the ones. It was just this weird feeling. And so I met with them. I decided to only meet with them. Um, and our very first phone conversation, I totally fell in love with them. I was like, they're the ones. That's it. I don't even have to meet them. I just know it. Uh, I did meet them, and we sat in a restaurant for like three hours and just talked about everything and anything. And what is your relationship with them now? We're like one big family. <laughs> yeah, it's really awesome. It's something that you don't really understand what it's going to be like until you're in it, that you kind of think, oh, well, these are complete strangers, literally complete strangers, and in my case, I met them. I knew them for like two weeks. And, um, but over the past year, we've literally become one big family. And we all get together and hang out for holidays. And <laughs> that's us. <laughs> that was in the hospital. The most amazing experience I've ever been through in my entire life. And this is one of our visits at my house. And this, we did a segment for Home and Family, and um, that was after afterwards. And that's baby Claire in yes. the middle there. <laughs> Thank you. Becky, your turn. <laughs> um, how old were you when you realized that you were adopted? I knew that I was adopted from day one. My parents raised me just knowing that I was adopted. So there were never any secrets, um, you know, any questions that I had, they were there to answer and to give me information. And I grew up understanding and knowing my adoption story. Um, and how old were you when you first met your birth mother? My birth mother and my parents were in contact, um, you know, throughout my growing up. Um, until around the age of eight, our contact became a little bit more limited. Um, it wasn't until I was probably 14 or 15 that I became a little bit more curious about her and wanted to you know, reach out and get to know my birth mom more. And coincidentally, my biological sisters had the same idea. And they actually found me online and reached out to me. And then when I was 15, we all had a big reunion and are now one big happy family. Great. Um, and what's your current relationship with your birth mom specifically now? Um, my birth mom actually passed away a year ago, but I am so thankful that I had those few years with her to really get to know her and have any of my questions answered from her specifically and to really be able to confirm um, my assumptions about, you know, why she gave me or why she placed me for adoption and um, just be able to have that relationship with her. It's amazing and I am so grateful that I had the time with her that I did. Thank you. And here's a picture of Allie, I mean sorry, Becky and her parents and and her birth mom and you can definitely see where she gets that sparkle in her eyes <laughs> from. <laughs> um, so a few more questions for everybody. First, uh, Bill and Scout, um, what advice would you give to prospective adoptive parents? I mean, I just, <laughs> I don't know. Um, what I, I just say to, uh, I like to share is that everybody has their own journey. So while you may know other people who are adopting, some um, people, you know, match very quickly, some don't. Um, we've met people, friends of ours who have uh, matched and, and literally had a last, you know, last minute birth and they were parents in seven months. It was like kind of uh, incredible. It was so fast, and we've also met um, people who it's taken several years. And you know, at the end of the day, um, we always share. A friend gave us this 
advice is that your baby will find you. So if you don't feel like it's happening at a certain time, it's because that's what is meant to be and that the baby that is your baby will find you. And we live by that. Thank you. Allie, do you have uh, any advice you would give to these prospective adoptive <laughs> parents that might be sitting in the audience? Um, I think my piece of advice would be to keep hope. Um, the adoptive parents I chose had a rough journey. Um, a couple of adoptions fell through, and um, but we've talked about it, and they say we're so glad that they did because we feel a connection with you that we didn't feel with anyone else. And so when you know, you know. And um, just waiting for the right one. And Becky, do you have anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> I think really what Ali said, I mean, my, I've heard my parents say the same thing for so long. They just kept the hope and then kind of just find each other. Yeah. And... Allie, what would you tell someone, or what do you tell someone when they ask you about open adoption? That it's awesome. I'm such an advocate. I'm like, anytime I can tell anyone about it, I love telling my story. I love talking to people about it. Um, and I think just telling them that it's it's the real deal. It's real. It's not some like thing that they say that it's open, and it's not. Like it's It really is, and it really works. Becky? Um, <laughs> like, what was the question? Um, it, I don't know. My story is, it's been amazing to kind of, I don't know, be able to grow having two families that kind of came together to become one. And I feel blessed that I have, I have two moms in a sense and that I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like... Uh, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, your turn. <laughs> um, I well, I think also it's probably more true of older generations. Like my, when I told my mom, "Oh, we're gonna adopt," and she knew we were gonna adopt. But we found this great agency, and it's called Open Adoption. And you kind of have to do, people go, "What's that mean?" And and like a scout said, are they gonna be able to take the baby away? And and how does it work? And it's just sort of a new concept for a lot of people who, who have only see adoption um, kind of played out in movies and television. Um, actually, Moms is doing an open adoption story right now. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of TV shows. The Modern Family, theirs was international adoption, of course, but they did the one segment on, on, on private adoption as well. Um, and last question for now. Um, do you have any regrets about being in an open adoption? And this time, Becky, I'm going to start with you. Um, well, 22 years ago when I was placed, um, there weren't as many guidelines as far as what open meant. Um, now there's more guidelines as far as how often there's communication. So I think my only regret is that I did go through that span of time without knowing my biological family. Um, but I was lucky enough to have that reunion um, and to be able to connect with them. But now with open adoption, there never has to be that kind of nerve-wracking reunion because the birth mom is always in the child's life. Allie, do you have anything to add? Uh, no regrets. <laughs> it has been the best thing that has ever happened to me. Bill and Scout? Uh, I just, our, I, we look... Um, at every experience and, and every birth mother, that that is the one of the most selfless acts that you can ever do in your life. So, there you go. That's for you. <laughs> that was for you. That was for you. But it truly is. Think about it. It is literally one yeah. of the most selfless yeah. things a person can do. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna I think open we could do some, some questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Stacy. I'm actually mom to Milo, who's two. Um, my husband and I uh, had a late start, so I'm 45. And we're, you know, he wants another child. I don't, you know, I'm like, I'm too old for that. But who knows if my eggs are in that position or not. But we're, it's one of those things where if we do want another child and we, because we are considering a, adoption, mm -hmm. um, 
And I guess my question is, is there um, like a preference when birth mothers are looking at your profiles and whatnot? Um, if it's on like online dating and people are like, oh, she's too old or they're too old, you know, because I mean, that is something to consider. I've considered it in my own child. You know, I'm uh, going to be an older mom, you know, so I didn't know. Is that something, A, that is a consideration or is an issue? And B, um, if we're just thinking about it, like we're, we're not 100% sure, do, should we start the process just because it would just be good, like you guys were saying, get it on the books, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, part of coming to an information session is to find out more about the process and your profile um, and all of that aspect. And since a birth mother is choosing you, there's going to be something that clicks that's not necessarily going to be age-related. There's going to be something about you that clicks for a particular birth mom, um, like Allie had mentioned, you know, just in terms of finding a family. There's something about that family that stood out. So we have had adoptive parents who were actually grandparents um, from a previous relationship that came to us, and they still got a placement. So, um, and that's why it's important to ask if the adoption professional that you're using, you know, has any restrictions. Um, I know we don't, <laughs> but it, it's it's a definite possibility. And the open, uh, the uh, sessions that they have, the seminars, was it once every two months, every month? Every month. Every month. Um, are free of charge, and you go, and is that when you get pizza, or is it the other one? <laughs> anyway, it's very nice. You're not, they're not trying to sell you a condo. It's not like a timeshare. Like, it's, this is what the information is. And then when, in terms of, like, our letter and, and what we put online, that we just put our lives online, and it's gonna, there might be some, they said, like, one time a birth mom thought that they looked really nice, and there was a dog in the photo, and they had the same, she had the same dog, and they're just, you just don't know. So you just put everything out there and put it out there as it is, and something will, will click. And then, like, just, like, on a, on a social media front, is that something that you looked at, and did, did somebody, like, give you, like, sh I mean, obviously, Scout and Bill were already on Facebook, and their lives kind of seemed just open, sharing, but then, Um, I actually didn't know their age until probably a year after the placement. It was not, it was not an issue for me. Um, I, yeah, I really didn't care. It, I, I just more was worried about the connection that I was going to have with them, regardless of age. Yeah, and, and in today's world, I mean, social media is such a big part of it that in addition to our website that every one of our prospective adoptive parents has their own page on our website. So that is how a lot of the birth moms are first finding someone and a lot of them set up Facebook pages and they're on Twitter and they're on Pinterest and, and use social media to do that outreach to find prospective um, birth mothers. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Yes. Uh, thanks, everyone. Appreciate you sharing this. Um, you mentioned uh, there's guidelines for when the adoptive parents and the birth mothers would get together. Uh, can you share a little more about what those guidelines are? Um, it's something that's determined with your counselor. When you're in a match, and in the state of California, we're actually very fortunate, and this is something that, that Becky referred to, um, there's actually something called an open adoption agreement, which is an agreement in writing that's negotiated, if you will, uh, with the between the adoptive parents and the birth mother to determine what type of contact everybody wants to have and the frequency and what that's gonna look like and everything that is planned to happen in the future. And in that regard, it's, it sets a foundation for that relationship because the open adoption agreement is actually filed with your court paperwork when you finalize the adoption. 
but you can always change it and we prepare everybody that just like any other relationship in your life, this is a relationship that is gonna evolve over time. Thank you. Oh, oh, did you well, just follow up? For, I'll just share for us, like once we matched with our birth mom, we had a call with our counselor at the IEC with our birth mother and she said, I would like uh, for the first year uh, photos every three months and I would like the option of a visit. And then after the first year, she just wanted um, like a first day of school photo and a birthday photo. And that was what she, that in her heart, that's what she wanted as the requirement. We would do much more. I mean, I probably send her 50 pictures a week. So, and that's our daughter, Simone, right there. <laughs> Simone, Simone is in the house. <laughs> Can you wave, Simone? <laughs> do you want to come sit with daddies? Want to come sit with daddies? She's going for the midriff look. She would like an escort. Did, did we have any other uh, questions from the audience right now? Okay. Oh, I just I just want to know. Do you put any of those uh, maybe preferences you think you're going to have in that profile that you put online, or is all that discussed after an initial? Connections, man. Um, in, in terms of details, since it's very personalized, it's discussed after the fact. But what you put in your profile or your adoption letter is the fact that you're looking forward to having an ongoing relationship at some level with the birth mom, whatever she's comfortable with. Oh, we have another question over here. Okay. My first one was going to be about the guidelines, so thank you for asking <laughs> and answering. Um, and I think it's amazing that all of you guys at some point said like one big happy family, but I can imagine that that maybe is not the case all of the time. So I didn't know if any of you had any issues with relatives, like maybe Al, your parents or the birth father or anything like that, that might've just been a problem with figuring out that openness of relationships. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> For me, the openness came really easily, luckily. Um, my entire family has a relationship with them. Um, the birth father is not in the picture. Um, that was a little bit of an issue for a while, um, just getting the relinquishment signed and all of that. Um, but once that was over, the openness came really easily. And like any relationship, it ebbs and flows. And we have bad days and we have good days. And it's really about being open about it, saying, I'm having a really hard time today and I maybe don't want pictures this week. Or um, just being really honest. That way there's no like hurt feelings or hard feelings that nobody knows about. Um, so we try to really just communicate and be honest with each other. And another thing that I would add is that in addition to educating you as adoptive parents and giving you materials to read and, and coming to our orientation, we also help you sort of educate your friends and family about adoption and, and openness. And I know my parents, especially being from, from an older generation, you know, didn't quite get what it meant to have an open adoption, you know. And then when they had the opportunity to meet my kid's birth mother, they're like, oh, she's really nice. You know, um, um, she's a normal person like everybody else. Uh, and, and then they understood it. So, so it really is a matter of educating and educating those around you in addition to yourself. Do we have any other questions? Can you do it into the mic? Hold on one sec, because we have people who want to hear you. Um, in terms of red flags, because I mean, I'm sure not everybody is like, you know, a great adoptive family or parent or couple or single person. So what are just some, you know, five red flags, let's say, or, or something that may be an issue of any? It's, it's kind of hard to give a okay. generic answer to that, and, and that is part of our, our process. Um, all of our counselors have at least a master's level, um, master's degree in social work, 
and we're all about picking out those red flags and supporting you and pointing them out to you or to a birth mom as you step through the process. So you're not left on your own at all to figure out what they are. And, and we even assess, is this a high risk placement, a medium risk, a low risk? And if that risk factor you know, changes throughout the process, our counselors will share that with you and then you can make your decisions in, in terms of moving forward. Any other questions from the yeah. audience? And with that, I just wanna say the IEC, our personal experience, all of our friends had an amazing experience. We have uh, one friend who, and everybody has their own journey, she just used a lawyer and it was not the same support group. So when these things come up, there's no support you know, in that way for her. That was our experience. That's why at the IC there's, you know, six or how many offices do you have now? Six? We're six up to eight. 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 You know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> you should know this. There's I know so I many, should. there's a whole I net, usually list them off. <laughs> there's a whole network. So yes. it's a network. It's not one, one person sitting in an office in LA. It's a whole, it's like six states of people. Yeah, nationwide we have about 25 or more counselors that work for the agency. So um, we just have about like three more minutes left. Okay. If you want to say anything, but I, I have a question which is regards to what you just mentioned. You have, you have offices around the states. Right. So different states have different laws, right? Yes. So visitation or openness and things like this. Can you speak to that? Because how does that work into it? Um, well, you, there's federal laws just in terms of, like, we're an adoption agency. So if the birth mom is located in a different state, as was the case, um, actually, both with Becky and with Bill and Scout, um, then there's guidelines that need to be followed. So if your birth mom's in a state where we don't have an office, then um, we help you locate an agency in that state and we work very closely with that agency. We have a whole database. And even in states where there's not a legally binding open adoption agreement, we still do some sort of agreement between birth parents and adoptive parents. And all of that is taken into consideration when we do those open adoption agreements because obviously if she lives across the country, then doing more than one visit a year probably is not feasible for everyone. Thank you so much, you've been so awesome. Would you like to take us out? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to quickly summarize just in terms of, of, there's been a lot of open adoption research and that research has shown that um, Ninety-five percent of adoptions nowadays have some level of openness, and that overall, it's the best outcomes for the adoptive parents, the birth parents, and the children um, via adoption. And um, I also want to just—I'll let you know if there are more questions. You can come to the Independent Adoption Center booth in the exhibitors area and visit the other exhibits and all our panelists will come back there with me after the session for additional questions. And I want to wholeheartedly thank Ali, Becky, Bill, Scout, and Simone for being here today and sharing their stories. And I would also like to thank the Independent Adoption Center for uh, sponsoring today. Uh, Fertility Planet, and again, these videos will be available online. Um, and for www.fora.tv uh, for the live streaming and the webcast. And I want to thank all of you for being here today and asking such insightful questions. And um, and be sure to uh, Twitter and go on Facebook, <laughs> hashtag FPLA14. Um, and share your experience and share what it was like um, just being part of this session. And one last slide, just to put it up there, some additional resources. Um, if you wanna jot these down, all organizations that have additional overall information on adoption um, and adoption resources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being part of this with us.